It started with our final contestants of the day. We've got Andrew and Jake. Only one person clapped? Oh, no. All right. <laughs> All right. It's been a long day. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Today's presentation is going to be on a tool we created called Splunk GPT. Um, but not only are we going to be discussing how we ended up creating this tool, we're also going to be going over how to use some of the prompt engineering techniques and how to use OpenAI, specifically the API um, calls, uh, for your own endeavors. And if you end up into the situation where you ran into where you need to build an agent, we're hoping by the end of this presentation you've at least got the key components. Um, and we'll also end up referencing our GitHub page here with how to build your own agent. And hopefully this helps spark some ideas there towards the end. So without further ado, let's move on to the who am I. So my name is Andrew Gomez. I'm an offensive operator at 6th Gen. That's a fancy title for a pen tester. Um, been there for a couple of years, and prior to that, I worked in the Army as a computer network defense manager. So I'm Jay Coin. very similar background. Started out in the Army, uh, did the, the DECO stuff, went to the OCO stuff for a little bit, and then made my way into the uh, reserves and, and work also as an offensive operator at 6th uh, Gen. All right, so we'll move on over to the next slide. Um, as we go through this agenda here, uh, think of it as the first bit being more of like an academic, hey, this is what an introduction or this is what an LLM is, here are the limitations. And then we'll move over to what we call our cookbook or our Jupyter Notebook where we're going to show off some of the examples. Um, and all this will be available later on and we'll provide a link to it. So um, if for some reason something doesn't make sense or you just want to steal this for reference later on, we'll provide all those resources and documentation at the end. So anyways, for our agenda of today, we're going to be going quick introduction, what led us down to the road of engineering Splunk GPT, discussing what, act, what agents are, and ultimately demonstrate our tool in action in a pre-recorded video, because uh, I don't really trust the demo gods. They're going to get us at some point. Isn't that the truth? Uh, so yeah, so we kind of started with Splunk GPT as like a plan and solve prompting sort of uh, work at, or work, but before we get into the Splunk GPT itself, we kind of got to bring you through some of the initial aspects of an LLM and what it really is. So an LLM itself is a specialized AI model that has the ability to generate uh, human-like text. So what we have is a model that's trained on you know, a vast corpus of data with different patterns, different nuances, and that kind of leads to uh, a unpredictability inside the model itself. But if you've heard of some examples like uh, Llama or Flan or BART uh, or GPT, then you've heard of some of the most predominant uh, LLMs that are, that are out there currently today. Um, but like any technology, there's a lot of limitations. Um, so hence the, the limitations here. And one of the main ones is token limits. Uh, so token limits, if you see GPT-3, for example, has a 4096 character limit, or token limit. Uh, I guess that should probably say token. But at the end of the day, the, the model is, or the number of the token limits are based on the model itself. So you're going to have variation. So GPT-3 in its original state had 4096. And that's like four characters is, is a token. And for each token, it's going to cost you uh, some money. So as we look, the computational cost, you're going to spend somewhere between, you know, uh, a fraction of a penny for a thousand tokens. Um, but as you increase in a model, for example, if you go to GPT-4, you're going to be paying pennies, which is significantly higher, especially when you have long prompts and long uh, responses that you're going to try and feed back into the LLM for uh, contextual relevance. Another path we ran down was fine-tuning. So if you're trying to fine-tune your model, that's also going to cost you a good amount of money. We spent some money there, and we'll let Andrew show you some more about that in a minute. But the model itself um, has these, these limitations that you need to take into account when you're looking. If you wanted to do a local LLM, for example, you're going to have power consumption requirements. You're going to have those types of uh, attributes you have to, to take into consideration when, when you're, you're building your system. Uh, and then the last thing, and some people would argue one of the more important things, uh, we saw it in, in Ed's talk in the beginning, or the keynote speak, uh, they, they can hallucinate. So, so models can come up with a, their, 
their intent is to be just a next word predictor. And there's some unpredictability because of the complexity in the model. They operate in more of a black box sense where we put stuff in and what comes out is what comes out. So they can make things up. Uh, they can hallucinate. And you know, if you're a New York attorney, that can turn out pretty bad for you. Um, so these are, these are situations or limitations that we have with, with LLMs and some of the examples we came across when we were trying to work through this app. Uh, one of the solutions that we came up with, or what well, we didn't really come up with, we implemented was the use of agents and working through some, some of that. But before we get into it, I want to let Andrew walk you through some of these uh, key points that I just talked about uh, in the notebook. Yeah, so what we did is we developed a cookbook here, just kind of walk people through if they wanted to later on on their own, and also just kind of learn on their own. Um, so when it comes to like the limitations of an LLM, we mentioned hallucinations. Um, and we also mentioned we don't really know what data it was trained with to start. So hopefully it's a little big enough. If not, we can expand this a little bit. Um, what we did is we asked in the user prompt, hey, write us a Splunk query that lists users with failed logon attempts. We used the DaVinci model back from GPT-3 um, and provided it a temperature of one, meaning it doesn't have to pick what it thinks is 100% going to be the next character. It has some flexibility with what it thinks the next possible character should be. Um, if you use the API Playground in OpenAI, you can see that demonstrated in green boxes. Uh, the more green it is, the closer it is to 100% chance that that is the next character versus the yellow and the red boxes. So we're providing the LLM, or in this case, uh, the DaVinci model, some flexibility with this response. And it really didn't come too close. This wouldn't really run in Splunk either, using the failure count index by username or by host IP. So we noticed that. We're like, OK. It, it kind of is giving it an attempt. Maybe it just doesn't realize like what the pattern is. And so that's when fine tuning comes into play. That's when you want to help it learn a pattern to output, not to learn more data. Um, and so nicely documented here on OpenAI's documentation is step one is to gather the data. Uh, we roughly gathered 500 different queries and formatted it in the same format that they recommend, being the prompt followed by what you think a user would ask and then the completion followed by what the expected answer should be. Um, and you kind of see that example there for looking at uh, failed logon attempts with both the administrator and guest accounts, with more than five failed logon attempts. I think we got this one from, I don't actually remember where we got this one. Maybe it was from Ghost Splunk's database from um, a question someone ended up asking on there. But um, once you gather all that data, have it in the proper format, you're going to go ahead and start training a model. In this case, we selected the DaVinci model, and we decided to follow it as it tuned it for that, um, for that specific model. And later on, ended up asking that model back in July, hey, um, we still want to list out users with failed login attempts. Um, let's see how you do. And it did come back with a Splunk query, but it's still not quite on the right track. So we started to head down the path of we have the right format, but in reality, we're looking for something similar to index equals main, looking for the Windows uh, source type of security, event code 4625 for those failed logons. So it's not really quite there, but we're in the right direction. So we took a time just to kind of sit down and we're like, hey, we've spent about 40 bucks off of 500 queries and we've gotten in the right direction, but we're not where we expected to be. We expected to have something like the um, response listed above. And so we're like, okay, what are our options? So we continue to reiterate on this tuning process is there already a tuned model? Because we're probably not the first ones to come up with this idea. Or should we do something called creating an agent? I want to discuss a little bit more what that is. Uh, we actually, ironically, a couple of days after we attempted to tune our model, saw Splunk had developed their own version of Copilot. And uh, Jake's going to go into how exactly this works. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's similar to what Andrew was talking about. But as he scrolls through here, really all this is is the first function there is just pulling the downloads.splunk.com. So you can go to Splunk Base, you can download that application, and you can uh, unzip it and look inside. And if you unzip it, you look inside, you'll see that there is a model in there. It's a T5 model. It's um, CPU optimized, so they have it in the open neural network exchange format. But these classes and, and all of this stuff is pretty much just ripped straight from, from the code that's in that application. Uh, so as we scroll down here, we're just using the model that Splunk tuned. And they have a whole nice blog post about it. And it's pretty much going down the exact path we were. So we figured, OK, this is proving our concept enough that if we can use this model and prove what we're saying, here we go. So now we ask the, the Splunk AI model, hey, write us a query that lists the users of failed logon attempts. And you see it gives you a much uh, better 
response, something that actually can run inside a Splunk database. But now let's ask it about something that likely didn't exist when they fine-tuned this model or when the T5 model was, was initially uh, open source released. And you see if we say ADCS ESC1, thanks to the, you know, the Specter Ops folks that are sponsoring, so we figured why not throw that in there. Um, it, it doesn't really give us something that's, that's exactly great. So we figured, all right, Splunk GPT, if we want to go through this route, needs to have access to some tools, needs to have access to some agents. And that's where we started talking about the road of agents. And before we get into all the intricacies, uh, we want to go through some of the engineering steps or some of the key concepts when looking through this, this I guess, adventure we went down. Um, so arguably one of the more important parts of any uh, Working with any LLM is your prompt engineering. There's plenty of prompt engineering methods. Andrew will kind of show us examples of some of them, but there's examples on the slide. So we have zero shot, few shot, chain of thought. Um, there's plan and solve prompting and reason and acting. Some of these are more recent um, techniques that were released into the public and, and definitely something that we used within this, this project. So in the, the next step that you kind of have to determine to get output quality and get output um, efficiency is some of the memory management. You have short-term and long-term memory. How are you going to manage the uh, conversational history that you are interacting when you're interacting with the model? Um, one step is vector databases. So a vector database is just a database that can take in, well, vector stores of information. So if we, if any of you sat through uh, the, the Nemesis talk, they talked about how they were taking some of the documents that they pulled from like a Cobalt Strike Beacon and forwarded that into uh, a embeddings model, got out an embeddings, and they were able to do some semantic search against it. Uh, we do a similar style approach here where we're taking proprietary intelligence or proprietary information, a fictitious blog post in, this ex in our case, or for the demonstration, to question and answer and identify contextually relevant information. Um, and then to address the problem with like ESC1, we give it access to some tools. So we give a different agent that has access to tools, and those tools are things like Google Search or Hugging Faces. Uh, well, these are examples, but we really use Google Search, and then we wrote a little function that allows it to go into and actually query a Splunk database using the, the open source Splunk SDK. So uh, Langchain was the main proponent for how we went about this, and, and you can see it when it's, it's out there. Um, and then, you know, lastly, chaining it as an agent, the, the big part here is we're able to uh, give the system or the agent access to tools and allow it to make a decision rationally or make a decision and act on that or make, take a thought of if it answered the question or what tools it needs in order to answer the question and then actually act on that by giving it access to the tools and external system. For example, Google search, if we say ADCS ESC1, It'll say, I don't know how to access that, and go out to the internet and get some, you know, some more information. Uh, so, I'm gonna pass it over to Andrew here, and he's gonna kind of walk us through some of this. So, starting off with the uh, zero shot approach, it's probably the most common um, approach that we use day to day with something like Chat GPT. Um, this isn't, for example, this is not using Chat GPT. This is using GPT's 3.5 LLM. So, there's a little bit of a difference here. Um, but the first one being when you start using something like the API and using something 3.5 and above, you're now able to start setting different roles, one of them being system, user, and assistant. When setting something like a system, we can see here in the message that we are now telling the LLM to act as if they're a cybersecurity analyst. So it's going to modify the way it responds as if it was an analyst instead of your average normal person. Um, and once again, we're asking here to create a list or a query that lists users with failed logon attempts and simply giving it some room for its creativity with a temperature of one. Um, and with a zero shot approach, we're not providing any other contextual examples or information on how we want its response to be. So it's gonna get creative and it goes, sure, here's your information. Index, your index, source type, your source type, action failed. So we've definitely got a Splunk query here. It just doesn't now know our indexes. It doesn't know what our sources are. Um, so that's one of the issues that we ran into with just implementing something like a zero-shot approach. You can't just take that query and run with it. It needs to somehow enrich it. Um, and so m maybe some of the ideas there would be implementing something like few-shot. Um, here, we're just doing a very simple example. We're not trying to pull something from our tool. 
Um, we're just providing the example of what a positive and negative comment is, and we're saying um, with FewShot, you're providing an answer in advance to what it should think it is, and here we're saying keywords like love is positive and hate is negative. So when we ask it, do you think this presentation is great? It says, yep, I think this presentation is great, and it's also a positive comment. So that's how FewShot works there. Um, an ad adaptation of FewShot would be chain of thought. Um, essentially, now we're starting to help it go through reasoning. Um, we didn't really give it like how to reason through someone's words or how to determine whether something's fa false or positive. So if you start giving it something a little bit more complex, like create me a list of tasks, it can get pretty funky on how it thinks tasks should be thought through. So here, we're trying to take an example from our tool, and we're saying now you're a task creation agent. Um, you're not part of any system or device. Uh, your first step is to understand the problem, then extract relevant data sources, fields, field values, and then based off the objective provided, uh, de what's called, um, create a complete plan, and then at the very end, your plan should always be to interpret the results. That's essentially how we're going to end up asking our agent to come up with steps to do something like detect a curb or roasting attack. And so that's what chain of thought is there, but you'll see down below, it's kind of unstructured data, it's hard to parse through, and it if you were to use this, it, you'd want to hope that it always starts with the word step one. Always want it to start with step two. Those keywords to help it kind of find that structured response. And that's something you can't always get when you do something like a temperature of one. So um, that's when you start implementing something like a plan and solve method, where combining the chain of thought approach with FewShot, and we're actually giving it not only, hey, step by step sort of thinking instructions on how to create a list of tasks, but we're telling it, how you should respond and in what format. So here in the examples, almost identical setup as far as the model and the message, the roles, but the examples is really where it starts to deviate is we're telling it what a JSON format should look like. Um, so that way later on we can parse this information with a Python json.parse. Um, and you'll see the example doesn't have to be related to the questions at hand. You just have to provide it an example of how you want things to be formatted. And later on, it ends up, instead of saying step one, two, three, and four, it just listed out those steps in a format that can be then passed to something like function calls. Um, so how do we end up chaining some of those prompt engineering techniques that we've just mentioned below, uh, uh, above? It's something with LangChain. It's a nice little wrapper that helps you build together all your different APIs. Uh, maybe you have different tools or different functions that you want to try to tie together. This is where LangChain's really comes into play and becomes a really powerful tool. Um, and we'll see that in the very beginning with a the final prompt engineering technique, which is reasoning and acting, or you'll see it sometimes called React. Um, typically, when you see someone use React, you'll see them load toolkit, SERP API is the Google API tool, um, specifying what LLM to use, and then giving it the, the key itself, initializing the agent, and then um, we've decided to return a verbose of true so that you can kind of see it in action. Um, and then finally, also saying, hey, this is the um, question we want answered. So here, what it's going to do is reach out to the internet and then go through um, its React process. But you can't see that. So what we did is we found the, um, the GitHub issue where someone's like, hey, I actually would like to modify the way it thinks through some of this approach. And so it said, hey, no problem. If you're interested in modifying the way it thinks by observing the question, the thought, the action, the observation, once again, a thought, and then the final answer, here's how you would do it. And so what you would do is you break out the prefix, your format instructions, and finally the suffix. Um, and up here in the prefix, that's where we start adding something like you are a detection engineer. You will do the following chain of thought approach. Um, and so that's where we end up piecing it all to kind of together for that very initial start to our agent, which is, hey, we need to identify which Windows event codes could be used to detect ADCS escalation path one. And you'll see it in action. It's saying, all right, so I need to go out, look this up. In order to look this up, I determined that these are the event codes, um, event ID 4876, and it kind of starts listing out what they're associated with. And then the final answer is the only thing you would actually get back, which is these are the event codes and you proceed from there. But just that by itself isn't enough. Um, you're gonna have to end up taking that information and enriching their task list, which is what we'll end up demonstrating later on in the tool. Um, the last little bit 
is vector databases. Um, as Jake mentioned, it's a great way to reference local files or just local information and then quickly reference it for your answers. Here we're providing just um, a very fictitious uh, scenario. A company called Evil Corp has developed their own software called B-Sides Augusta. They unfortunately fell um, to a supply chain compromise attack where now that B-Sides Augusta piece of software is looking to install a backdoor on every system that it's currently installed on. Since it's a service being run as admin, the first thing it tries to do is see, hey, does, is there a local user called B-Sides? If not, let me create and add that local administrator account. Um, and so that's the fictitious scenario, and that information is being stored in this blog post. And what we've done is we've broken down and stored that information into an embeddings model and just asked it, hey, what are those three minor attack techniques to the B-Sides Augusta supply chain compromise. If you went out and asked an agent to use SERP API, it's, n it's not gonna know. This information doesn't exist, and it'll either uh, come back and tell you it doesn't exist, or it could also hallucinate. Um, but by enabling this vector database, we've now got the ability to research information that you might not want publicly accessible. Uh, maybe you've got like a private report that's specific to your company, and this could help enable the team to rapidly search through the information and then use an agent to um, query your seam and then analyze the results based off of that information. So um, the last little bit is tools for interaction. We've kind of already mentioned one big one, which is just using SERP API to research the internet. We've started to mention vector databases. Um, you can use more than one tool, and that's really all this last one's getting at is we're using the React prompt, we're using the SERP API, but now we're also using a math tool to help determine um, based off of today's date how long ago was it from December 2nd, 2013? And it ends up going through that process of Googling, hey, well, besides Augusta, it happened to occur today. Um, and the answer between the date you provided and today is 3,595 days. So just showing for that one example, you don't always have to use one tool. You can chain multiple tools into lang chains, and it'll help piece it together as it's going through its prompts. Here, the React prompt determined, hey, I actually need to implement the math tool to figure out the answer. Um, and that's about it before we dive into the agent, right? Or am I jumping into the agent? Okay, sorry. We originally had an extra slide and um, always get thrown off on this part, but we'll go ahead and dive into the agent itself, specifically building an agent with function calls. So we mentioned the first step is to just generate a list of tasks and then research. Um, what it's doing on the back end is determining, hey, should I research locally or should I research out on the internet? Then based off of the first task, which is going out and researching, um, let me refine my list of tasks. So now I'm no longer looking to create a Kerber roasting query in Splunk. I want to create a query to detect Kerber roasting using these specific indexes, source types, event codes. So the query itself is becoming a lot less likely to fall into the trap of a hallucination. Um, and we're starting to execute each task one by one. And that's all we're trying to highlight with this little mind map here is it's gonna end up going through its execution. Uh, should I f start by writing the Splunk query? Um, should I then go back and determine what f uh, fields I actually have? Um, should I refactor the Splunk query that you gave me? And then finally, does this query need a statistical analysis to help refine a detection approach? Does it need something like a count of greater than 10. Um, and then finally, we can't always trust it to be on its, done completely on its own. There is a final piece that asks for human interaction or human input. Um, hey, your query actually uses a completely wrong index or it uses a completely wrong source type. This is the option or the opportunity for the human to interact and say, nope, actually remove this line or modify the query to say this. And then it executes and then retrieves the results and analyzes it. Um, and so what we've done here is just kind of provide you a snippet of what those tasks look like and how we're calling each function is when it creates the task, it actually determines, hey, the first agent or the first task should be number one and that agent or the function we're gonna call is the Splunk writer. Second one, filter, refactor, statistical analysis, execute, and then finally analyze. Much like how a human would determine, hey, in order for me to write something like this query that you're asking me, First step I need to do is understand the problem, determine what information helps me answer it, and then ultimately interpret my results and constantly refine it. That's all we're trying to bake into this agent here at the end of the day. Um, and here, the function calls are really just going through conditional statements and checking, 
for that agent field. Is it the right field? Is it the filter field? Um, and that's all it's doing here. Um, I've commented out the actual tool in action because Jake's going to be demonstrating that here in a second. But essentially what it looks like um, on the back end, which is what our Streamlit application is not really going to be highlighting, it's just going to be showing like, hey, I entered this function. Um, when it first starts off, you see the, the uh, B-Sides Augusta attack starts off by writing a Splunk query called Splunk query equals. So straight off the bat, it's not a valid query. But then as it filters and refines, it's starting to create a more valid query. And ultimately, we come down to the point where we start asking for user input and say, hey, is this good? Yep, it is good or no. Um, and at the very end, we do say, hey, we don't need to modify it anymore. It goes ahead and executes it. And then a very uh, brief version of the answer comes back saying the Windows 10 host was the one that was compromised. Um, Jake will actually end up showing our tool in action here um, to give you guys a little background on the environment we ended up using. If no one's ever used the game of Active Directory, uh, GitHub repo, it's essentially a nice automated way to quickly deploy out three domains with a bunch of built-in Active Directory vulnerabilities and allows you to kind of learn stuff like ADCS attacks or maybe you want to learn about relaying or NTLM downgrading. Um, great tool to go out there, set up your own deployment. Um, takes about three or four hours to deploy the entire domain, or I guess in this case three domains, versus imagine standing up on your own those three domains, then configuring them for those vulnerabilities. This is just a nice automated way, um, and it saved us a lot of time. So now I guess demo time. Yeah, and one other point to the Game Back Directory, there's a great blog. The people who wrote it, uh, Orange, I think it's like Orange Sec or Orange Cybersecurity or something like that, has a great mind map and a blog that goes along with it. So definitely recommend that. Um, but yeah, so so in the demo here, what we have is is the Streamlit application, which is just saying, hey, write a Splunk query uh, to detect, insert what you want in my Windows domain. So we put in Kerber hosting, and the first thing that's happening is, as Andrew was showing, the tool is going through. It's actually determining, I need to research. I need to find more information about Kerber hosting, and it's going out to the internet. It's taking. Uh, the serb API, well, it's going, it's scraping for URLs. It's going to take those URLs, send those to another function, which is then going to take all the content that is on that web page in plain text. The, then it's going to go to another LM, which is going to say summarize this content, because as we talked about the limitations of token limits, we can't just send seven web pages worth of information of plain text and say, summarize this for me. We need to summarize each chunk and then summarize the chunks of chunks into one main point. Uh, and once it does that, we send that summarized chunk of chunks to a different uh, agent. And again, this is, these are different LLM, or these are prompts basically, but LLMs that are pulling out this information of unstructured data and it's going to structure it for us. So we said pull out the event codes that are relevant and then we send that off to that Splunk search feature, which is going to actually search the Splunk database, do like a field summary and then parse that data, bring it back in and feed that to the next uh, prompt base or the next agent. And as we go through, it's now creating that, that task list for itself. It's the one to end steps. It's determining what agent it wants to use because the context is given. Uh, it's then going to loop through and actually execute each, each agent here. Um, so once it's finished executing all of those agents, it comes out with this Splunk query. And as you can see, if you pause it here, I was just editing at the human feedback, and that kind of shows some of that, that hallucination we were talking about. It got it a little wrong. And we just know this as, as humans, if that, you can move it around, I think. So what it got wrong there is it's actually source. The source type, or the source type would have been win event log, but the source is win event log security. That was provided the LM, yet it still got it wrong, and it still put source type. We said that the source was this and the source type was that, but it still decided to just concatenate the two and do whatever the heck it wants, right? Um, but we're showing here in that Splunk search just a second ago is that it doesn't actually exist, right? Uh, no results came back, so if we fast forward a little bit past that, you can see that um, the, the app will get the results back. This is just out of band showing you the real Splunk, dash, the, the real Splunk search, so um, you can go here. Let this thing finish. It's going to come back with, oh crap, no results. And then the LLM is going to interpret those results that it got and say, hey, the query was attempting to do this. 
And this is all about how you engineer that prompt. We engineered it to say, give us a high-level summary as if you were presenting this to a mid-level manager. So it's presenting it that way. Um, it's saying, hey, there was no, no detection of curb roasting. But now we're going to go through and we're going to ask Call Drogo, right? Everybody who loves Game of Thrones would love to be Call Drogo. Uh, well, I guess maybe not at the end. Um, yeah, so with that, we're going to actually run a curb roasting attack uh, using that on the SQL service. And go ahead, run through. OK, so that is successful. So we should expect to see some results here. And we'll go through. And the exact same thing is happening again. We're going to do that research. We're going to go and pull the relevant event codes, gather the relevant information, create that task list of how we're going to go about creating the actual Splunk detection, uh, and then forward it. In this case, it got it right. Right? It didn't actually say any source type. We're just checking the query. and. Everything, everything looks right. Uh, so just basically hit enter, no human feedback. And copy that whole query, paste it into Splunk for a second here so you can see that there are some results. Always forget to change the time, so. And there we go. So there are results, that is what we expected. And just for clarity, those were two different Splunk queries to detect the same thing. It just generates it how it wants, there was some difference in there, uh, how it goes about detecting it. But the results that come back are fed back into a, a summarization of those results. And what it says here is the, you know, the queries are designed to detect curb roasting. Uh, and the results are that the call Drogo and the SQL service um, are somehow correlated in this curb roasting attack. Uh, so based on this, it's recommended that you do further analysis and so on and so forth. Um, and lastly, on the, the left side there, you see that search local vector data store. Literally all that does is prepend a local search to that search uh, function. So the text string of local search is literally the only thing that's prepended and or a prefix. So that kind of lets the, the LLM decide which tool to use, whether it's internet or local. So now it's going to use the local vector data store. It's going to search that Splunk B-Sides Augusta uh, blog post, which is completely fictitious. Nothing, exam nothing actually exists. Go through the same chain. So the only difference there was the um, research. And as it goes through, it's now looking for relevant, or it's now generating that task list for itself. And we can fast forward a bit, because Andrew showed you pretty much that in the uh, talk there. Whoops, let's go a little bit back. Get the results. It's finishing up. And there we go. So like I said, it was fine. And these aren't going to be the most like efficient Splunk queries either. That's what we've kind of come to the conclusion. They're not, you know, doing any accelerated data model search. That is potential future. But, you know, you're not going to say, hey, do a T stats on this because I have 10 billion records, right? The, uh, you're not really going to probably want to search in, in all time with some of these Splunk queries, that's for certain. But it's it's more of the the concept that's being proven here is that it is going out. It's looking at the semantic similarities of that document. It's then pulling back re contextually relevant information, feeding it, building a query based off of that information. And those queries are then running with very minimal uh, changes. So it gets the results back. and you know, the summarize of those results is, hey, it successfully detected these instances. We think that you need to do some more research. And also, the Win10 host is, is a, big, uh, a big red flag for you. So that's pretty much, uh, you know, the demo. And some of the references that we've, we've really gone, or some of the things that we uh, took into consideration a lot uh, were, or not took into consideration, took inspiration from. Uh, baby AGI, Agent GPT, if you're looking for a good blog post, Agent GPT on Reworked AI's site has a great one. Uh, baby AGI, it's supposed to be automated, generalized intelligence, or general intelligence. Um, that's a great project that's out there. It helps really understand. It breaks things down, or it's easier to read their code as opposed to trying to go through like auto GPT or Agent GPT. Their code is, is really well uh, written, and there's a million forks off of baby AGI to include uh, easier to understand. Um, projects that are out there. So Baby Coder is an example that's, is this still working? Yeah. Baby Coder is an example that uh, that's out there. 
And then Splunk AI, obviously you guys saw we, we totally stole that from them. Uh, so, you know, that, that's a great piece of information. And some of the future work, minimizing the amount of prompts that we have. Our prompts are fairly long. These, we were trying to get um, where we wanted to and had to do those extra different agent steps. So if we were able to build uh, maybe more efficient prompts, prompt engineering is hard. Uh, it is definitely a task that is uh, sought after in the, the real world. So if you're really good at building those prompts, you can probably make some good money. Uh, and then just continue testing and refining. So we're you know, got the, or we have the project up on, on Andrew's Git, so you're able to take a look at, at what we got and don't make too, don't make a fun of our, our coding abilities too much, but yeah, I think um, we have some questions we're supposed to ask to give you some prizes here, and then we'll uh, try and take some questions. I think we talked really fast, so we're a little ahead of schedule. But Andrew, I think you got, or I can think of the first question. Can anybody give a, well, can anybody give for this, Blue Nomicom thing book. Can uh, anybody give a an example of uh, you know hallucination that uh, you've seen in the real world? Um, what you got back there? Uh, I I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, that's that's a good example. What? <laughs> I was I was like, <laughs> yeah. So that's a great example. Um, obviously, the funny one is the one that I tried to reference, and then also was talking the keynote. You know, and a great example is the New York attorney who had a great time with trying to explain to a judge why he thought ChatGPT was 100% right, and that judge was wrong, and all of literature was wrong. <laughs> all right, for mine, I've got the easy pickings, lock picking set, and guide. I'll give this to anyone that has a question for us. All right, in the back. <laughs> Yeah, so the question was whether or not our employers, uh, Sixth Gen, paid for us to do this um, at, by sponsoring us. Um, and if this had stemmed from some sort of employee, or not employee, but um, previous engagement where the company had asked us to develop something like this. Um, the answer is no. Uh, Sixth Gen didn't say, hey, we want you guys to go and give a presentation. Um, they do strongly encourage. Um, and provide time to conduct this research, but it wasn't something that they were like, hey, we have this task, we need someone to go out and create an agent to write Splunk queries. Um, we do have a tool that is being utilized right now to um, essentially, s we have a tool called the Raven, it's a red team deployable kit, and one of the things that they're working on right now with um, an LLM, except it's gonna be a local instance, is searching all of our documents that we have for using the server itself and troubleshooting it into a chat agent where you just go to Mattermost and you're like, hey, how do I do this? It'll read all of the documentation using a vector database. And so that's something we've helped out a little bit, but it's not like a immediate ask from the company. It's just been more of a side project where we're like, hey, uh, Jake messaged me and he's like, I've got a great idea. I was like, oh no, <laughs> this can't be good. Um, so that's where this kind of headed down. Um, but good question. Um, hmm. I feel like the, the most interesting challenge was there, everything moves so fast. So you're trying to work down one process and you're trying to think through, all right, I want to use this uh, lang chain method or this lang chain, I want to bring in this, this technique for this prompt engineering method or, or whatever. And then all of a sudden, you know, a month later, lang chain's like, hey, great idea. We've now got 17 different things that you can can look up and you can you can do so like the speed at which the the uh, I guess world is moving right now is a unique challenge that I don't think we've seen in many other places 
uh, there's, there's always something new and something better or what you think is going to be better um, that's coming out. So that's definitely a challenge that I don't think uh, expected kind of going into it, um, especially in the last, like, I don't know, since January. So however many months, what, 10 months, that should have been easy math. But, you know, I went to a state school. Um, yeah, what else? Any other questions that you can? Yeah, and his. So the question was, uh, are the Jupyter Notebooks available on our GitHub? The answer is yes. The presentation, the demo, the Streamlit application, as well as the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and then we have another Jupyter Notebook there, which is just the Streamlit application, just not in Streamlit. Um, in the event that you don't really like Streamlit because it's a little finicky and it's hard to go and manage those sessions, um, you have the ability to just rip straight copy and paste um, from that other Jupyter Notebook and don't have to worry about visualizing it in a pretty web app. Um, any other questions from the group? Uh, the question was, have you tried incorporating internal intelligence? I think Jake actually had an idea for this. I mean, yeah, to a degree, yeah. That was kind of the point of that blog post, which was uh, the fake blog post. We literally just we wrote up a 500 or 1,000 word just nonsense post saying, hey, B-Sides Augusta supply chain attack, this, that, and the other. And that was kind of the proprietary information. That was the proof of concept for that proprietary information. It was stored locally. It was embedded uh, locally. Well, I guess we use the OpenAI embeddings model, so they have all that information too, right, in theory. Um, but with that said, it could have been any model you want because we use the Langchain, which is great. You just say LLM equals whatever you want. Um, and whatever embeddings model, there are local embeddings models. And that's kind of how we were going about that process of uh, using the local intelligence or local uh, proprietary information that you would want to embed and then retrieve. Um, that does get kind of expensive, like again, computational costs. Anytime you add another document, you're going to have to embed your whole entire document store again and again and again and again. So like, there are challenges to that, that method. Um, and, you know, fully accepted, but you know, it's just kind of the way that we were going about it. Yes? Well, I, I will say I'm very thankful to have bought $22,000 worth of Cisco calls, or Splunk calls before the, the acquisition. So I'm a millionaire now. Um, no, I did not. That was not me, uh, for any of you who saw that in Twitter. Um, I think that the Splunk AI kind of process that they're going down, because as you saw, that was a blog post. That was really recent. That was, I think, in March, that, or when, it July. July. It was in July that they put that blog post out and showed the, the uh, Splunk AI assistant. So I think it's going to go significant. I think that uh, with Cisco's acquisition, they're probably just going to have more resources. Um, I'm not really sure of the internal corporate structure, how that really looks between when Splunk is bought out or if that actually happens, but yeah. What else we got? Anything else? Think of anything? Well, I mean, definitely thank you guys for coming out. I know that was the last talk of the day. You guys were probably uh, ready to go home, sleepy. Got here early at like seven. So uh, we're ending a little early, 10 minutes or about 10 minutes or so early. So if uh, there's any questions, we're up here. You didn't want to ask the group, but we're up here. And otherwise, thanks for coming out.